this is my first video with pink hair. Oh my gosh, look how cute it looks on the camera. Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. My name is Evelyn and today we are talking about graphic novels. So there has recently been some controversy surrounding graphic novels as a legitimate form of literature, yay or nay. I personally am on the yay side because I think that anybody who tries to tell you that the way that you want to read is not real reading is just being an elitist fuckwad. Um, and there's no need to listen to elitist fuckwads. Specifically, the author S.E. Hinton, uh, she wrote The Outsiders, which is an okay book that some of us were forced to read in middle school. It has been turned into a movie, and somebody tweeted at her recently and asked, hey, would you consider turning it into a graphic novel? A lot of my students, I believe they were saying, uh, are really like graphic novels. I think that it would get a lot of people into the story if it were in a graphic novel. And Essie Hinton did not respond well to that. I don't remember the exact phrasing, but she basically implied that flipping the pages of a graphic novel is not the same thing as reading, um, and that her book is special because it's the first thing that a lot of people read and really enjoy and like find the joy of reading it, which like, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there. But like, the thing is, when I was a kid, the first thing a lot of my classmates found joy in reading was Diary of a Wimpy Kid. I feel like y'all are probably familiar with it. It's a graphic novel series. I believe there are 15 books now first started publishing in book format in like 2004, but it was a webcomic before that. And this book legitimately affected like my entire class on like a really profound level to the point where there's this thing called the cheese touch in one of these books. and basically there's like a piece of cheese that gets left outside on their playground and somebody touches it and then touches someone else it's like like tag like you've been infected by the cheese touch and you have to like try and give it to another person and you try to avoid who has it someone literally took an actual slice of cheese slapped it on the blacktop outside at our playground just so that we could play the cheese touch game ourselves like, that was how deeply ingrained this story was in our collective adolescent consciousness. So, don't tell me that a graphic novel cannot instill the joy of stories and bring stories to life for kids. Like, that's just wrong. When I was growing up in the early 2000s, they were just becoming a thing. So, Diary of a Wimpy Kid was definitely the biggest one, but, like, I think what really started the trend was actually Captain Underpants. The first Captain Underpants book was published in 1995. I was born in 2001 and they were still a thing when I when I was a kid. Because Diary of a Wimpy Kid was so popular you got Dork Diaries which was like sort of marketed as the female version of that and I have lots of criticisms of both of those series uh, but that's not what this video is about. There's like this stigma that like if you give a younger reader a graphic novel, you, they're not actually going to learn how to engage with like real books, right? Which, again, total BS. Yes, it is important for children to learn how to read a text and analyze a text and think for themselves and think critically about what they're reading. But especially when they're in elementary school, you have to get them engaged first. Lots of kids have trouble reading traditionally published books, whether that be because they have ADHD or some sort of learning disability or they just aren't interested. Like, graphic novels are a really good tool to get them interested in stories and transition them into real literature. Honestly, I can read a graphic novel faster than I can read any book and that is not because they're 
easier to read is because I get so immersed in them. So there were a couple of graphic novels that I really loved personally as a child. Uh, Autoline and the Yellow Cat, which is about 50% illustration, 50% text. It's by Chris Riddell and it follows this girl who lives alone with her uh, hairy little friend Mr. Monroe and they like to solve mysteries together and so they are solving a string of cat burglaries that has happened across the city. It's quirky and fun and I loved it so much and having those illustrations really brought the story to life in a way that was so magical and I wanted to read it over and over again because there was always something new to discover within the pages. I also really loved the Baby Mouse books by Jennifer L. Holm. They follow this adolescent mouse who has a really overactive imagination as she tries to deal with like school and popularity and like family issues. And one thing I really remember about that is those books made me less self-conscious about being girly because they were literally printed in black, white, and pink. Pink was like the one color. And I remember at first being self-conscious about reading them because I was very much in the middle of my like, pink is for girls, don't call me a girl, like phase. Um, but I love those books so much that I sort of like didn't care. And it, and it was something that was like, unapologetically feminine in a really cool way. This is just one example of something I'm probably going to touch on a lot throughout this video is the fact that graphic novels oftentimes are brave in the way that they portray a story. Um, like they are unapologetic about having queer characters or disabled characters or characters of color. Um, they're unapologetic about being silly and zany and magical and wonderful in a way that, like, sometimes you don't find in other forms of literature. But the thing is, I sort of fell out of love with graphic novels for a while. Possibly because of the influence of elitist fuckwads. <laughs> who didn't think it was real reading, possibly because there's like a gap in the market. I'm not sure, but like literally just earlier this year, I sort of fell back in love with graphic novels and uh, from their web comics, because a lot of the graphic novels that I have read and loved, including like Diary of the Wimpy Kid, started out as web comics that were eventually published by presses. And so I am going to do a second video later where I talk about the webcomics that I really love and would love to have an actual printed copy of someday. But for today, we're just talking about graphic novels that I have found and loved recently. All right, starting with The Tea Dragon Society by Katie O'Neill. A young blacksmith apprentice named Greta discovers the magical world of tea dragon caretaking when she finds a lost tea dragon in the marketplace and returns it to tea shop owners Ezekiel and Eric. These books are like a little magical burst of like sunshine. Honestly, they make me so happy. They're set in this sort of magical world where all of these different creatures sort of live in harmony and the Tea Dragon Society raises tea dragons. They're like a small ornamental kind of dragon and each different dragon is a different kind of tea. So there's like jasmine and chamomile. They have these leaves that grow on their horns that you can harvest and the closer a relationship you have with the tea dragon, when you brew the tea it like shows you happy memories. It's just such an adorable concept and in this first book it really focuses on this relationship between Greta and the ward that the tea shop owners have taken in who has lost her memory and how they bond over the tea dragons and <laughs> it's just so beautifully illustrated. There are more books in this series and I, I've loved every one that I've read and like if I just need cheering up I look at a tea dragon and I am I'm automatically like 10 to 20 percent happier. <laughs> Next we have Check Please by Ngazi Okazu. 
Eric Biddle, former figure skater and current baking blogger, is about to start his freshman year at Samwell University. As if starting college isn't intimidating enough, he's going to be joining the men's hockey team. A daunting task for a gay boy who's afraid of getting checked. I absolutely devoured the first volume of this graphic novel when I got my hands on it. I had been wanting to read it because I'd heard some good things about it and I just happened to get access to it. I'm like, okay, I'll give it a try. Oh my gosh, I just fell in love. I melted. I fell in love with Vinny right away. He is so relatable. He's very Southern and he loves to bake, so we have that in common. And I just love the little family that he finds within the Samwell team. I love that every year you have a graduating class but then you also get the new students who come in and so like the family's always welcoming more people into it and I love the romance aspect of this oh my gosh it's handled so well and I love that in the second book I'm not trying to spoil anything but in the second book you actually get to see them deal with actual relationship issues past just getting together, which is not something you typically see in something that's aimed toward younger new adults. So that's just so cool. Um, and it's and it's a gay relationship. It's like a healthy gay relationship on page and it's amazing and I love it. Next we have Mooncakes by Suzanne Walker and Wendy Sue. Teenage witch Nova spends most of her time working at her grandmother's plural, magical bookshop. The family also investigates supernatural occurrences in their spare time, which is how they come across Nova's childhood crush, Tam, battling a horse demon in the woods. It has been years since they've seen each other, but it turns out that Tam is a werewolf who is being pursued by a dark force that wants to steal their magic. Nova promises to help, but what happens when old feelings begin to resurface? This graphic novel is filled to the brim with magic, but also with diverse representation. Both of our main characters are characters of color, which is amazing, but what stood out to me even more is the fact that Nova actually uses hearing aids. And I realized about halfway through reading this graphic novel, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so special because you can see the hearing aids, right? Because a lot of times marginalized characters, people will leave out the parts of their identity that they can't see because they're reading it as a text. That's how we end up with like whitewashed versions of characters in fan art because people conveniently forget that they were people of color. And so a detail that some people would be likely to overlook, like the fact that Nova uses hearing aids, is impossible to overlook in a graphic novel because it is part of her character design. And I think that's an amazing way to show readers that characters like them can exist on the page uh, that can be more meaningful than putting a character like that in traditional literature because they don't have to do the work to imagine it, they can see it right there. And I think that's another reason why graphic novels work so well to get kids engaged with things is because they can see themselves, literally see themselves on the page. That's not to say that there isn't merit in being able to read a text and imagine, right? Like that is definitely an important skill to have, but it's also important just to not have to do that work, to put that work in, right? To be able to like actually see these characters holding hands and being in love and being characters of color and wearing hearing aids and etc etc like that has value in its own right and that is very just revolutionary to me i think it's so cool next we have nimona by noelle stevenson lord ballister blackheart is a villain determined to prove that his nemesis sir ambrosius goldenloin and the institution of law enforcement and heroics aren't actually the wonderful heroes everyone thinks they are. His brand new sidekick, Nimona, might just be the key to him finally finding that success. He didn't exactly ask for her, 
but as a shapeshifter with a knack for villainy, she might come in handy. If her mysterious powers and impulsive side don't put everyone in too much danger first. I was just blown away by how clever this graphic novel is. It's witty, the world building is incredibly cool, it's like this blend of like medieval fantasy style stuff and like technology. And I just love the character dynamics. You sort of never know who to root for because like the main characters are the villains, uh, but also maybe the heroes are the villains, but also there's definitely something sketchy going on with Nimona, so the entire time you're just like, what is happening? And you honestly just want everyone to be happy, and like, it's just such a wild roller coaster, and I, I, I really do love it so much, and if you haven't picked it up, I really, really recommend it. Next we have Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me by Mariko Tamaki. Freddy's on-again, off-again relationship with the enigmatic Laura Dean is an emotional roller coaster for everyone involved, including her friends, who are more than a little fed up with the whole thing. In fact, she might be about to lose her very best friend over it. But with some help from her new friends and an advice columnist, she may be able to figure things out. This story is so cool. It has some really important messages about toxic relationships, specifically sapphic relationships that have turned toxic, and also about self-love and, and being there for the people who are there for you, and it's honestly, it's gorgeous. It's so pretty. Like, I think out of all of the graphic novels I've talked about in this video, it is the most beautiful, in my opinion. They're all beautiful. I can't even believe I said that. They're all beautiful. This one just like took my freaking breath away. It's just, ah, so gorgeous. I read it in like two hours and then immediately wanted to reread it. I stopped myself, but I, I do, it's on my list. Like I really want to own a copy. Um, like immediately I, I finished reading it. I was like, I want to hold this in my hands. Next we have Mary by Brie Grant. This graphic novel follows the adventures of Mary Shelley's great-great-great-great-great-granddaughter, Mary. She is the longest in a line of Shelley women who is, according to her mother, destined to become a writer. She is just not so sure that writing is her calling, but she may have inherited another Shelley family gift, the ability to heal monsters. So this is really cool. I love the universe that this is set in because it incorporates all of these different monsters from folklore, so not only like the Frankenstein's monster, but also like harpies and and sea monsters and demons and ghosts and all these things. It's sort of like a paranormal urban fantasy world, but rooted in like traditional folklore almost. I am really intrigued to see how the story plays out in later books because just the world that was set up was so interesting and I also just loved how Mary putted up against her mom so much just the expectations placed on her by like generations worth of women writers and not knowing if she like if that is her calling um, is is really interesting. There's already all this pressure on young people to like know what they want to do by the time they are like 18 and ready to go off to college and so I think it was just a really relatable feeling, Mary feeling like trapped by that expectation. Mary Shelley on her own would be like a really big set of shoes to fill, right? Like my girl revolutionized an entire genre of fiction like that's a lot to live up to let alone like being like a bridge between humanity and these monsters like the current mary has a lot on her plate and i i fell for her and last but not least we have the fantastic tales of nothing by Allie green and fanny rodriguez on the fantastical island of nothing, humans coexist in an uneasy peace with shape-shifting creatures called Vulcan. Our hero, Nathan, is a totally normal human. Or so he thinks. 
But after an odd encounter with a being named Haven, who was neither human nor Vulcan, he discovers that he has mysterious powers. With a little bit of help from Haven and two disgraced Vulcan, he sets off on a quest that will potentially save the island. So this graphic novel is set to release on November 17th, 2020. Catherine Teigen Books was nice enough to send me an e-arc and I was so excited to read it because it has Latinx representation in it and I just fell in love with this band of misfits getting themselves into some magical chaotic adventures it's like my favorite kind of story and I love seeing it come to life on the page the world building was amazing the illustrations were amazing I I was I I loved it. I finished it in a day. I was so invested and I cannot wait to find out what happens next. Oh my gosh. But yes, I think y'all should totally be on the lookout for this one when it releases next month because I loved it. I just love seeing this diverse cast of characters on the page. There's different skin tones, different features and body types. Haven uses they them pronouns. It's just also very casually inclusive and wonderful and I would like love to share this story with kids I, like I would have loved this story as a kid it's such a fun adventure it was just so dynamic and exciting and I finished it a few days ago and I'm still wondering what happens next I care about these characters I was invested in these characters and their story and the world and that's why it's so shocking to me. I mean, it's not shocking to me because elite as fuckwads will be elite as fuckwads, but like, it's mind boggling to me that they would even imply that you cannot gain anything from reading graphic novels or that graphic novels are not as engaging as traditional literature or, or the stories aren't as important. Like, all of these stories are so important to me. All of these characters were so important to me. I hate people sometimes, you know? Do you just ever hate people sometimes? <laughs> all right, that is all that I have to share with y'all today. Moral of the story, read more graphic novels. Honestly, every graphic novel I have ever read has left me with a huge smile on my face. And I cannot say the same thing about every traditionally published book I have read, let alone every classic that I've read. If you like this video and you want to see more from my channel, uh, in particular my video about webcomics that I am planning a little bit up here, then remember to click that subscribe button. Leave a comment down below. Are there any other graphic novels that y'all love that I should be checking out? I want to hear all of your recommendations because honestly they make me so happy and I want to feel happy. Especially in 2020, I want to feel happy. With that being said, my name is Evelyn, I make new videos every magical Monday, and I'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.